Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always my co-host Nick Villato. And today we got a special guest on the podcast. It's former Tennessee volunteer quarterback and New York Jets quarterback and the son of Giants legend. And that's Matt Sims joining us on the show today to talk quarterbacks, talk Giants quarterback situation, and everything you guys have always told us you want to hear about playing the quarterback position. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Why don't you tell everyone, first of all, where they can find your podcast and what you're doing also with Sims Complete QB Training. Yeah, Sims Complete is a podcast that I'm doing with my father, Big Phil Sims, the big effer, uh, just talking football and sharing about the game that we love as much as we can from our, our own perspective. Uh, we do it all the time in the kitchen almost every day. So we're like, why not make a show out of it? Uh, but yeah, you can see uh, father and son having debates on what's going on in the current NFL news and stuff like that. Um, that's available wherever podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, all that kind of stuff. And then Sims Complete QB is uh, my training company where I uh, train and mentor young QBs, uh, primarily in the tri-state area, but got guys, you know, all over. So very fortunate that I'm able to share the wisdom with them. Please go check that out, everyone. And Matt, Thank I want to start real quick with a hypothetical, okay? Oh, it's God. Here we go. <laughs> pre-snap. Third and eight. The crowd is loud. You're on the road. It's a passing situation against an aggressive defensive coordinator. What is going through a quarterback's mind in the pre-snap phase of that type of situation? So I'm going to kind of break it down into like little, little uh, bite-sized pieces for everybody at home. So when you are going through the preparation during the week, as far as the defensive coordinator that you're going against, the stuff that you have been practicing up to that point that has worked well on third down, the things that you saw on film that the other team did well on third down, you're basically breaking down your third down packages into three different segments. The first one's the third and short, so it's like your two to threes with occasionally your goal line player two if it's like a third and, and a one. Philly with the Philly push, obviously that one's available everywhere on the play sheet. Um, the medium stuff, right, which is typically four to, you know, six or seven. And then you have your third and seven plus. And then there's the chunk plays when, you know, it's uh, it's third and 15 or 20 because of penalty. And you're just trying to get maybe half of that back to maybe go for it on fourth or to set up the punt. So what you're doing in that situation, third and eight, you're expecting a play call that you know goes into that third and seven plus category from the coaching staff, right? Unless the coach comes over on that headset and goes, hey, hey, we're going for it on fourth here. You don't need to get it all right now. We got two plays here, two plays. We're going to go with this here. So you know when you get that little heads up in that headset, Okay, I could just put the ball in play and take a check down and move on to the next one because we know we have two downs in this certain situation. Other than that, in third and eights, most quarterbacks and QB coaches and offensive coordinators are saying, if it's there, take it. If not, don't worry about it. Let's punt it and let's move on to the next one. If we're living in third and eight world a lot, that means that we're getting our ass kicked on first and second <laughs> down, and we probably shouldn't win the game anyway. But Typically, those third and eight calls are uh, usually quick game things, screens. The 49ers just see a ton of receiver screens, ton of halfback screens out of third and eight situations. Um, and then typically, you'll see, depending on the de uh, defensive coordinator you're going against, if he's a heavy man type of play caller, you're going to see more so like pick plays, shallow crosses, anything where we're trying to get some sort of mesh release to confuse people on the back end and kind of pick them off themselves. Uh, zone teams, you're trying to really just do your, your day one install type of zone concepts. And then you're really just focusing on the quarterback, really being disciplined with looking off a certain defender to make another hole in the zone that much larger. So long answer to your quick question, but, uh, that's essentially what's going through your head is just like that whole repertoire of, of plays that you have in your playbook. And you're hoping that the, co the coordinator calls the one that you listed as your favorite, uh, especially the night before or that week. That's awesome, Matt. And just to give the fans a little bit of preview of what we're going to do today, we're going to go through sections here. We're going to ask Matt some questions about playing the quarterback position. He has a lot of experience doing that. We're going to ask him some questions that I know you guys want answered about Daniel Jones as well. We're going to ask him some quarter questions about training quarterbacks and that whole area. And then we're going to actually go over some plays with Matt and he's going to break some down for us. So I know those of you listening really interested in that as well. So we're going to get to that, which is really cool. But Matt, I want to ask you a question that came up on a mailbag episode for us two weeks ago. Cool. We got asked to break down the three to five most important traits to look for when evaluating a quarterback. The ones we came up with were one, how often a quarterback can throw with anticipation and throw into space. 
two, post snap processing. Does he understand where the space is going to be? Can he get tricked by post snap rotations from the safeties? Three, pocket manipulation. Can you slide and reset? Where do you escape to, uh, or do you escape from pockets? And then four, arm talent, not necessarily arm strength, but the ability to change trajectory, pace, and ball placement. What would you say about those four things? And what would your answer be to this question? Yeah, I think all four of those things are actually they're they're very accurate as far as what you would expect from a one of 32 type of football player. Right. And, and I always say to my young students, too, I hope that you're the 32nd best quarterback in the NFL one day, because that means that you are still a really, really good football player. Um, but at the same time, it kind of depends on the identity of your football team and what's being asked of that individual. You know, and, and the debate right now is is the Brock Purdy debate, which I think is a perfect way to kind of explain, you know, what you're discussing here with your fans is if you put Brock Purdy in a lot of offenses right now that demand a lot of him physically to make dynamic throws down the field with power and all that kind of stuff, he's probably not going to be quite as successful as what he is with the San Francisco 49ers offense. Now, that's not taking anything away from Brock. Brock is absolutely a very capable quarterback, a very good processor of information, a great leader, right? And that's one thing that that's not on that list. The leadership thing is a real thing because when you get in that huddle, you need to look at these other Johnnies and Joes and be like, yo, I could take you there. Do you believe me? You know, like, and a lot of the cases, old linemen, receivers, they can look at you and be like, nah, this ain't the guy. I don't like the way this guy's talking or the way he's presenting himself, right? So those things are very real. So it really kind of depends on just like the beauty is in the eye of the beholder at the quarterback position. And you have to really maximize because not every one quarterback has all of those qualities that you're saying that are 95 and above, you know, in the Madden rating world. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sense of what this young man does extremely well, and you're trying to maximize it a ton. So Tua Tunga Valoa and Brock Purdy, both with that same coaching tree under Kyle Shannon and Mike McDaniel, a lot of their passing, quick short passes, rhythm passes, throwing into space, throwing in rhythm. Well, when you take those things away, you don't really see much from either one of those quarterbacks that often. You don't see that getting out of the pocket and just putting the game you know, on their shoulders or on their backs and just making dynamic throws into tight space and coverages. So you know, it really just depends on how you view the position, how your offensive coordinator views the position and how you can maximize what they do extremely well. If Brock Purdy was on the Buffalo Bills right now, you know, they they might not have won a game because they just asked Josh Allen to do so much as a physical specimen running the football, throwing lasers down the field. So it's just it just varies. And I think that's what's so fun about the quarterback position, why I have so much fun coaching it, too. A lot of fathers that I coach like, hey, does my son have it? I'm like, have what? You know, <laughs> does does he have the will and the discipline and just the attitude to be really gritty and to enjoy this marathon, which is quarterback, because it really is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And, uh, you know, Tom Brady's a great example of that. Tom Brady got better and better each and every year that he was in the NFL. He was not what he was uh, the first year of his career, what we expected him and saw of him late in his career. I think that's an excellent point, too, because you look at Daniel Jones, for instance, like going with Pat Shermer, seemed like he was comfortable in his rookie season. Jason Garrett, not as much, not to throw too much shade over there at Mr. Jason Garrett over there at NBC. But then Brian Dable comes in and just maximizes what Daniel Jones had last season. And I think it plays into exactly what you're saying. It's just maximizing the specific talents that Daniel Jones as a quarterback offers. And I want to ask you something real quick, just from a quarterback or a professional football player's perspective, and you may have just provided the answer, but I want to get your opinion on this. What's one thing that fans kind of consistently overlook that is understated yet very important regarding playing football and just being a professional athlete? Uh, you know, definitely just the time on task. I think a lot of people, as far as the fans are just like, yo, what are they doing? They're idiots. It's like, you know, I don't know, man. They just spent probably, you know, 700 hours this past week trying to dissect what to do really well. Their job wasn't to go out there and to F it up, man. You know, like they are actually trying. Um, I think Giants fans are a little bit more understanding of this, whereas Jets fans are like, our team's just a bunch of idiots and like we're cool with it. But that's a whole different, uh, you know, subject matter. But um, yeah, just the time on task, I think, is something that I think most fans just don't understand. And, and, the the sacrifice 
that the coaching staff, the players, everyone from management and scouting to, to what they do. And we can all say that we're just, you know, geniuses after the fact because we're, we're fans of the game and we, we love to just react. But the amount of hours that are put in by these individuals to, to go out there and perform um, is, is tremendous. And I've been a part of really, really good football teams. And I've been part of really, really bad football teams. And I can tell you that we spent the same amount of time as everybody else. You know, it didn't differ. We didn't do more because we were bad and we didn't do less because we were good. You were just there working and grinding and just trying to, you know, pursue perfection as much as you possibly can, even though it doesn't exist. Yeah, everyone always has those jokes about the football guys, coaches who are just there and sleeping and living and breathing it and never go home to their wives. It's the same thing with the players. I just don't think everybody <laughs> realizes that. Like Daniel Jones is a good example. He's the first one in, last one out every day in the building. And I think me and Nick, Nick and I have discussed this, but we feel like that's a prerequisite for a starting quarterback, especially if you're a franchise quarterback, to be right. first one in, last one out. There are obviously examples where that doesn't happen, and sometimes those quarterbacks don't work out. But, Matt, I got to ask you a question that – we consider the age old question for this podcast, just because <laughs> we do put a lot of emphasis on post snap processing at the quarterback position. Yeah. And we've asked every former quarterback like yourself or quarterback evaluator or quarterback coach. We get both here. We get two. We get a quarterback coach and trainer like yourself and a former player this question. And so I'll ask you this. And there's been mixed answers. So I'm curious to get your take on this. Do you believe the post snap processing aspect of playing quarterback is something innate and natural or can it actually be improved? I'm an optimist and I like to think that anything with time on task, you can improve upon it. And I know for right now, uh, you know, all three of us, we're probably not great artists, but I know that we spend 10,000 hours drawing and practicing and doing things every single day. We would get better at it eventually, right? No matter how much we are slightly handicapped in that side of our brain. But at the same time, with the quarterback position, some people, yes, they absolutely do have a little bit more of an innate uh, ability to understand, to dissect this information a little bit faster, and uh, at least from the start. The key is, can you survive long enough by being somewhat successful to then become a master at that? You know, And that's really the biggest thing, because a lot of guys... You know, you, you heard Patrick Mahomes say it. I didn't even know what the defense was doing the first year of my career, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he said it on, on the shop with LeBron James and all them. And, you know, I could believe that there, some of that is possibly true, that he really was out there just kind of like playing ball. You hear stories about Brett Favre, and he didn't even know what the nickel backer was, and he was like seven <laughs> years in the league. So there's some of it that is just kind of like, you're just you're you're gifted by God just a little bit to kind of just know how to play the game and to know that at the end of the day, you just got to throw it to the guy with the same color jersey. But at the same time, I do believe young quarterbacks can improve at this skill set given opportunity. And the key is, is can you learn and improve from that opportunity that you're given? Tom Brady is absolutely a better processor as far as a pass thrower in his mid thirties and forties than he was when he was in his twenties. And that's a fact because that's what they were asking him to do right. when he was the younger quarterback, play action, run the football, super simple concepts. As he evolved as a player, as the game evolved, taking away some of the uh, abilities of defenses to be more aggressive. That's when Josh McDaniels, the offense became more creative, started doing more plays. And all of a sudden he evolves as an individual too. And, and again, the environment allowed him to do that and, and gave him permission to do that. Whereas a lot of the times I feel like, especially with certain organizations, they stifle the growth of quarterbacks and make it very difficult on them to improve because it's more so of playing in fear than it is trying to be courageous and maybe somewhat uh, careless at times to, to learn from those things, right? And there's, there's a fine line between them. I love how you 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 finish that map because it, it is that like borderline of carelessness that you almost want to be like, don't be reckless. But at the same time, if you're not <laughs> reckless enough and trying to fit this into these windows, how you know how what's the ceiling here? And I thought sure. it was really interesting what you mentioned about Brady, because it is a great point. The way that Belichick team was set up in the early Brady years, it was a lot different than in the later Brady, Brady years from how much is put on his plate. So definitely something hopeful for Giants fans or any fans who want their quarterback to progress from. Uh, Geno Smith's a great process. example, too. You yes. know, Geno Smith. 
I I was with Gino in New York and, and I was there during his struggles. And, you know, he's asking me questions like, you know, hey, Matt, what do you think? I'm like, Gino, I don't know. We're both rookies. Like, <laughs> we're trying to figure this out together, man. Just trust what you see and cut it loose, man. You know, and and there's a lot of truth to that. And through that experience, you just hope that you can gain knowledge and an understanding of, of what works and what doesn't work. And fortunately for him, he was given another opportunity to show all this hard work and effort and a lot of failure to become this great player that he is now. Waldron, yeah. I love the way Waldron manipulates the different launch points for where he's throwing, like for some of these plays. It's so cool, sets them up. But like you said, right. he has a little bit of that recklessness to him, to some of the throws in some of the windows. He tries have to, to. have yep. to, you know, absolutely have to. It's, you know, and that's the thing that like, uh, was definitely one of my advantages uh, of being a backup third stringer. You know, the the guys in the team, the coaching staff knew that if the window was like this, I was probably going to throw it and just get it done, you know, and they knew that I was brave enough to do that. I remember in one instance, I was with the Atlanta Falcons and we had a play called. We got the wrong coverage for it. And I was like, man, so I went through my read, but then all of a sudden the wide and go opened up versus cover two. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to throw it as hard as I can between the corner and the safety and just rip it to the sideline. I completed it for a big play, came to the sideline after the drive. And Matt LaFleur, who's the head coach of the, the Green Bay Packers, he goes, he goes, holy. And he he's like, <laughs> he looks at Matt Ryan. He goes, Matt Ryan. He goes, can you believe he threw the whole shot on this play? Yeah. We've never even talked about this. And Matt yeah. Ryan's like, yeah, you know, Matt can do it. And I'm just like, yeah, cool. You know, I mean, it's just. Every now and then you kind of have to have that ability to do those things because no matter how much you plan, stuff does go awry and goes away from what you plan the whole time. Circle back for a quick moment on that. I would say I would make the, the case that that is the innate ability to process post snap right there. What you just showed on that. It's kind of natural how you do oh, I you appreciate know I it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take the feather and why not? <laughs> it's the Andrew Luck argument. Andrew Luck, obviously fantastic talent, but one of the one of the things that we loved so much about him was he would rip the tightest of windows and he trusted himself to get the football into the most narrow windows. And yeah, it led to some interceptions, but it also led to some of the more explosive plays of that right. era. You watch Mahomes and Kelsey, and it doesn't even look like he's running traditional routes. Like there's obvious chemistry between those two players. How important is that quarterback wide receiver or quarterback tight end chemistry? And can you take us through an example that you might've had through your playing days, whether that's at high school, college, or in the NFL? Uh, well, I definitely never had chemistry with anybody to the degree that these two gentlemen had, <laughs> you know, because this is just truly like poetry in motion. What's really cool when you watch Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes work is that uh, we've been in enough rooms and watched the game enough to know that, you know, there's, there's scramble drill rules, right? And I get out of the pocket, I start running to my right, you know, the guy who's to the sideline, you know, you can work back to me. The guy that's away from me, you work back across the field, get into my vision, all that kind of stuff. Travis Kelsey seems to do the exact opposite of what he's being told to do or what was originally yeah. told to do. It's like Patrick Holmes starts to run right this way, and then Kelsey is going out the back door the opposite way. And he knows that, like, the defense naturally wants to continue to work with Patrick Mahomes in his eyes, and he's doing the exact opposite, knowing that Patrick is capable enough to turn, find him, and throw the ball across the field or across his body. So a lot of it, I think, is just backyard ball stuff that with Patrick Mahomes having the ability to do these things, um, you always hear that, that cliche of like, oh, never throw it across your body. Never throw it back across the middle. It's like, no, don't do it if you can't do it. But if you can do it, absolutely do it because it's going to be a huge play. And that's why like Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson – you know, all of those guys that we hold at the highest regard of the quarterback position are capable of doing that. And that's even something that I really focus on, too, with even my students, too. You know, I have drills where I make the throw as difficult as possible. And I tell them, I'm like, listen, just we're practicing how to get our body through and across the field. I know that your coach will never allow you to do this, but there might be a moment in the game where the game is on the line. The person is there open. And you're going to just innately do this because we've worked on this. And it's really cool because occasionally it does happen to those students. And, you know, the coach like, oh, my God, what a play. Mm -hmm. and, and I know deep down I'm like, yeah, we do those type of things. And you're not asking them much of it because once you're kind of introduced to it, it gets that much more comfortable after the fact. And for Patrick, Andy Reid, Travis, 
It happened in practice one day. This was pretty cool. It happened the next day. Okay. And then all of a sudden, you know, 50 days later, you're like, no, this is just what we do. When we break the pocket, we make things like this happen very easily. And that's what's really cool, you know, about the position and, and the freedom that Andy Reid has uh, with Patrick Mahomes. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less, yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, Part of your game day. There are a few things better in the world than kicking back, watching some football, and biting into some delicious Little Caesars pizza. Order online during our Pizza Pizza pregame, one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs, plus all day on Sunday. And get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Old world pepperoni, pepperoni, extra cheese, Italian sausage, olives, onions, pineapple if you're into that. Put it on half the pie, the entire pie. There are so many other options that I don't have time to name. Slap that on a round crust, a thin crust, a stuffed crust, a Detroit style deep dish. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, Everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. We are brought to you today by Manscaped, who has taken a step up from Halloween to bring your face the cleanest shave it's ever seen. So this season, no need to toil in trouble. Manscaped's all-new handyman is the best way to get rid of that stubble. Featuring a compact design and next-gen skin-safe technology, The Handyman was designed to give you that smooth finish without the mess of a traditional shave. Get the sweetest treat this Halloween by going to manscaped.com and use code BIGBLUE for 20% off plus free shipping. And for all my wolf men out there, yo, shout out. If you got a little bit more scruff on your face, Manscaped's Beard Hedger Pro Kit has everything you need to tame your mane. This cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard, so no more drawers full of extra add-ons collecting cobwebs and is very annoying to organize. There's no trick with this treat. Manscaped has you covered. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BIGBLUE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code BIGBLUE. For a look as sweet as candy, get yourself the handyman from Manscaped. Are you too busy this fall to cook? I know I am. Between watching all this mediocre tape, DFS, pumpkin picking, whatever other fall activity I have to do, it's just plain tough to find a time to cook. That's why I'm so happy I found Factor. Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. It can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. And if you head to factormeals.com slash bigbluebanter50 
and use code BIGBLUEBANTER50, you'll get 50% off. That's some cash savings right there. So again, head to factormeals.com slash BIGBLUEBANTER50 to get 50% off your factor meals. With your your father as as a professional quarterback, he probably gave you tips on how to play. I'm imagining that was not one of them. No, actually, he was doing those things for me. Oh, he, he was. He really, yeah, go. he really was. He, you know, because my father, uh, you see all these quarterback gurus now, you know, about creating torque and creating, you know, power through your trunk and through your body to create power to throw. My father was absolutely like one of the first OGs to think and do those things. And um, he just, you know, wasn't like tied into social media to where he could take the credit for it. Mm. But my father as a thrower was very much like that. He had that ability to do those things. Um, My father essentially invented the back shoulder throw, you know, when you really think about it. His throws to Mark Bavaro, you know, his receiving core was always, uh, you know, maybe slightly average compared to NFL standards. So what do you do? You throw the ball powerfully. You throw the ball head height right at the target, you know, as aggressively as you can, because even when you're covered, you're still open for great throwers. And, uh, yeah. and, and that's something that my father definitely instilled in me. And that was one of my, my greater, uh, uh, one of my things that I did much better than I think the, uh, the average person growing up. I love that line right there. Even when you're covered, you're still open. If you're, if you have a great thrower and that's, that's so much of what we see in the NFL today is exactly what you just said, especially with how the rules have changed as well. It's much, it's much more difficult to cover those receivers in those positions, especially, and also the chemistry, right? Like the chemistry yeah. could be huge in those situations when it comes to those back shoulder throws. But right. I want to ask you a question, Matt, An- another question is about playing the quarterback position as someone who's prepped for game weeks. Um, so, Having done that, can you just walk us through our listeners and, and us as well? Because we literally have no idea what it would be like of what the preparation is like day to day for the week. Like what's Monday like? What's a walkthrough like? When do you feel comfortable with the film and the game plan, everything like that? Yeah. Uh, so Monday is typically you go into the facility. You're watching the film from from Sunday. You're reviewing all of your plays, what we did well, what we didn't do well calls that maybe the offense coordinator would have liked to have had back or have called in a different situation. Quarterback also sharing some of his thoughts on like, you know, maybe we should have gone to this play instead of this play because so-and-so was doing well. Um, and you're basically just trying to fill in all of those voids that for whatever uh, reason did not work. And then you're really just trying to expand upon the stuff that did work right during the game. And then, after that, you have your walkthrough, you review the pros and cons of the plays that you did well, didn't do well, specifically uh, situational football, which would typically be like review on third down, especially in pass protection, red zone stuff, um, and then whatever else the head coach deems necessary as far as a special situation that maybe the team struggle with that you want to make sure that you really nail down because it's something that will possibly repeat itself later in the year. Tuesday is typically a day off for the NFL football teams on a typical you know Sunday schedule. Uh, so those are days where, you know, for quarterbacks, either watching the film, you know, by yourself or with the quarter, the other quarterbacks, just kind of getting a feel for the last like three or four games of the opponents that you played. Those are things too, when you're watching the film, you're kind of just like skimming through it. You're not really like looking super detailed at it. You're just kind of getting a feel for like, all right, yeah, Hey, this is like the fifth time in a row. Now during this game, as soon as that team crossed midfield, you know, defense quarter came with the pressure. Uh, this is like the seventh time that are always seen this team's in the red zone or these teams in the red zone. And he dialed up this, this cover zero or this cover one blitz, um, you know, just outside the high red zone area. So you're just kind of getting like these generalized thoughts in your head. And then Wednesday you're doing your first and second down install days. So first and second down are just typically your your first and second down runs, first and second down pass plays, and you're getting the percentages as far as what typically, you know, that defensive quarter calls on those down and distances, especially if it's a first and second and medium or average down and distance, which you already kind of have a feel for, too, since of the film uh, from the previous day. Thursday is a third down day. It's all third down the entire day. By that time, through watching film, practice, all that kind of stuff, you kind of already know what to expect from the defense third down-wise from the from the last three or four opponents and what from that defensive coordinator has done against this offensive coordinator of, of our staff 
for the past maybe three or four years or in their history together. And you're breaking that down by the down and distance as best as you can. You're starting to build a little bit of a hierarchy of the plays in which the offensive coordinator likes the best and what you like the best too. Friday, that is a day where you're doing that exact same type of thought, like in third down, now for specifically the red zone. You're working from basically the top of the red zone area, 25 and in. And from there, you're doing that exact same thing again. These are plays that we want to run in the red zone and first and second down. These are our third down calls in the red zone, high red zone area. These are our low red zone calls, first and second down, third down. And then from each part of that uh, that red zone area, you're picking your like scoring plays from there where you know that, hey, if we call this play, we can score from the 20-yard line here because this play will develop enough for us to get into the end zone or for us to catch and run. And the same thing going all the way down to the goal line. Um, and then Saturday, basic review of all that stuff. You either travel when you get to the – or your home. You get to the hotel, and that's where – Typically, Saturday nights, you're having that last run through with your coaching staff, the offensive coordinator, quarterback coach, the QBs of like, hey, which plays do we like the best here in these certain situations? Which is the first, third, and three call that you like where we know we're going to get a pass completed here? And those were always fun, too, because you really get to see what the quarterback likes the most, what the offensive coordinator values the most. And what's really fun is when everyone's just like exactly on the exact same page and sees it the same way. Those are really exciting too, because uh, they typically end up working out better for everybody because when you kind of have belief in the play, it's, it's just got that much more success rate, you know, for it to go well. When you hear a QB like, I don't really like this one. And then the coach calls it. You're like, <laughs> ah, this shit's not going to work, you know? <laughs> so, um, and that happened a lot, but, uh, you know, it, it is really cool just kind of how you you break down the game plan and then all of a sudden, you know, everything just kind of happens live and, and you and you play. So there's like a little power struggle between the quarterback and the offensive coordinator at times. Like you want one play call a little bit more, but the offensive coordinator might favor another play to your chagrin, essentially. Uh, totally. And I'm not going to say names here, but there was definitely <laughs> in one situation where one coach loved a certain concept where it was like a spray out route. And it was to the field. And this quarterback was like, don't want to do it. Not going to do it. Don't call it. I hate this play, you know, and like was actually very genuinely honest like that. And sure enough, the coach called it that Sunday and uh, it was incomplete and uh, we had to punt it. And I just remember like, I was like, that's the last time we will ever see this type of concept or that play for this quarterback. <laughs> and sure enough, like the next day when we were reviewing again, um, you know, the, the office coordinator is like, all right, I get it. You hate this play. We're not going to call it anymore. You know, you got it. No worries. <laughs> you know? And the QB was like, yeah, thanks. You know, like we didn't have to waste that play if you would have just listened to me. Cause I just don't feel comfortable with it. So it's really interesting that way. It's also cool. Cause you mentioned how these coaches, they essentially have a Rolodex in their mind of past experiences against other coordinators of what their favorite play calls were basically right. fragmented at each part of the field. I thought that was a really interesting. And it also plays into experiences King in the NFL, unless oh, yeah. you're really novel and have like a Mike McDaniel type of situation. But Matt, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you've played for a few different offensive coordinators in your career. Can you explain to our audience how drastic of a difference systems can be and how or why some are more conducive than others? Ooh, you know, Everyone is at the NFL level is super creative. It really is. And I, I always say to everyone, because everyone loves saying like, oh, college football inspires NFL football. It's like, no, it's actually more so the other way around. College football is so elementary in so many ways. It just drives me nuts sometimes, you know. Um, in the NFL, these dudes are, are unbelievable. Really, the biggest difference between a lot of great play callers and average play callers is just the ability to to think plays ahead but also to think plays that match what your team identity is and the rhythm of the play calling right so many guys and this was something that an offensive coordinator said to me he goes because he saw college football the way i do he goes like college football is exciting he goes but it really is for amateurs you know and i was like why do you say that he's like because well, he's like let's just watch this drive together he goes, oh, the coach called this play. Uh, then I'm going to call this play. 
And then, you know, let's just try this one out, you know? And he's like, you can't do that in the NFL. Like in the NFL, it has to be very systematic with like, we're running at the will linebacker here. We're forcing the will linebacker to fill the B gap. After he fills the B gap three or four times on this run play, we're going to throw the play action pass over this will linebacker. Right. So it's like, you're constantly setting up plays in advance or forcing defenses to play a certain look or formation away, which then allows you to then say, we have them in the look that we wanted. They've done it consistently now, two or three plays in a row. Now we're going to call this play and make it and kill them with it. And and that's what's so fun. And then after you kill them with it, it's over. You know, typically, you know, it's like in college, you could run the same play all the way down the field. In the NFL, it's like you have a little bit of success. The next drive, all they're doing on that sideline is saying, this is why this happened. We can't let this happen again. And that's what's really cool about like great teams compared to average teams each and every year because the great teams really do solve problems very, very fast. And you won't have continuous success with same concepts. They just have to be uh, drawn up a, a unique way to look new or different to a defense. Yeah, that was an awesome point. I think about all the coordinators Nick and I study throughout the years this year and and watching tape of other teams this year. It seems like the ones who have the most success on offense are the ones who do exactly what you just said, set up, set up, use everything to set up the next play. And right. there, we've seen a lot of Giants, different different Giants coordinators throughout the year. Some have, tr- I feel like every coordinator has tried to do this. Just some have done this a little better than others in, in my mind. And obviously, you know, the stats show it as well. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit, Matt, also about training quarterbacks. I thought that was really interesting, and you can offer a unique perspective there. Speaking of Sims Complete um, and your work as a quarterback trainer, you talk a little bit about, this is something I've always wondered, how important the marriage is between a quarterback's footwork and their entire lower half uh, in relation to their upper body, both in the dropback phase or in all three of the phases, the dropback phase, the pocket manipulation phase, and then the throwing phase. So, you know, that's something that is – We don't have enough time to really talk about it. (laughs) No, we we do. But like, it's just one of those things that uh, one, it goes back to a little bit of your processing, right? In in question. It's something that some kids are really gifted with and born with immediately. And, you know, I, I coach them on, this is how we pivot and push away from center. We don't just swing back and, you know, do the bucket step. We're pivoting and pushing because we're changing direction like a change of direction change of direction athlete would. All right. That's something that some kids immediately like, got it. No worries. Right. Others has to be drilled into multiple times, almost like, uh, you know, like Miyagi do like wax on (laughs) wax off over and over and over again until all of a sudden it is habitual. It does come naturally. Right. So there is that difference as far as the way things go, the footwork and the body placement, a lot of kind of stuff. A lot of the stuff that I teach is focused primarily on kind of breaking a lot of the rules or the basic um, common conceptions that people think about with the quarterback position, like stand, you know, reach back and rip it. It's like, (laughs) no, we're going to, I was like, I I love teaching on the run first because teaching on the run really focuses on a few different things. One naturally to throw the ball level to a target you have to stand upright you have to be vertical even if you are running so as i say to my quarterbacks we have to be in a presentable way to the throw we can't be leaning forward and accelerating like you are a real runner you're a passer all the way until you turn into a runner right which is the line of scrimmage so we teach that vertical spine right keeping your head back as i tell my students all the time you know i was like i want you to think like you're marching like you're frankenstein right yeah. or you're a, a a soldier in the army you know chin back and head up as much as you possibly can and then it's the step turn and throw which is something that my father and i will say to students at nauseum and the step turn and throw is something that we'll see in the film breakdown that we do is that every time that we kind of take a step the step turns into the throw And then as we load up that bow and arrow, so to speak, once we kind of hit that apex of the moment, everything gets released and then recoiled back into the throw for power and for for most optimal power without using as much energy possible. And, um, you know, what you really try to do is you try to just get these different throws on the run, moving, throwing across your body 
to really force the student to understand that there's more power within them that they actually are really understanding of because every young quarterback always thinks about the arm and the arm strength and not about the core strength and the core rotation. That was so a long to answer. Sorry about that. No, uh, no. We, it's we literally love... exactly what our listeners want to hear. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, we, we love the nitty gritty on this podcast, Matt. And uh, you kind of touched on this already, but what are the easiest and the hardest things for developing a quarterback to learn through your training? This could be whether uh, it's a starting quarterback who has some experience or someone that you just get who is brand new to the position. Yeah, so that that's what's really interesting too is that everyone's like, oh, my son's been playing quarterback for seven years, you know, or my son's just new to the position. Really doesn't matter in a lot of ways, especially uh, certain age groups. Now, if you're someone that's new to the position at high school at quarterback, unfortunately, you're a little bit behind the eight ball because all of those experiences on the field, you know, are are tough to learn that late in your career. But, um, what's really great about the position of quarterback and what I think my father and I hold at a very high value is your ability to mimic. And you really just have to be able to watch us demonstrate. And which I think is really cool about what we do as as unique things. Like I'll show you how to do it and I'll literally go step by step with you and then rip the ball. And, uh, and a lot of my students are like, wow, you're pretty good. I'm like, yeah, that's why you're here. (laughs) But, um, (laughs) You know, it's interesting, like you just got to be able to watch someone do it and then be able to mimic within that next rep or two. And we hear that all the time with like quarterbacks, like I can get the mental reps in. It's like, that's a real thing. That's the ability to kind of put yourself into, you know, an out of body experience and understand what that person is going through. And then to be able to apply it to yourself in like a visualization type of concept And that really is the separator between like super talented quarterbacks that we've taught versus quarterbacks that, that again, like Miyagi do need a lot of drills and a lot of other ways to kind of trick them into success. That's a really interesting way to look at it and kind of, I think it all does tie back to the first, you know, the second question we we discussed with you, like really thinking about those traits and what what really progresses a quarterback, Matt. Um, and I do want to spend some time because I know we promised this. And we'll just just to <laughs> recap, we'll go over some Daniel Jones discussion now and maybe some Tyrod Taylor. We'll break down the plays. And if there is any time, we might want to get into with you some of those stories you share with us before the pod, because I know our listeners <laughs> love it. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see where we're at with that. But all right. I want to talk a little Daniel Jones with you first, then we'll get into some play. Uh, some some film breakdowns, but I wanted to first see like what were your general what are your general thoughts on what you've seen on tape from Jones as a whole this season, and how would it compare maybe to what you saw in twenty twenty two? For example, is there any kind of difference in timing of the passing game, the ball placement, anything like that? The first thing that's really noticeable is just the fact that they can't protect him, and that's really an issue. And it's really an issue too for the quarterback position more than anybody. Uh, you know, as far as the need for others to be successful for you to be in successful in return. And occasionally when you are, you know, burned by the fire a lot to start the year, it, it's very hard to then drop back and say, well, this is the play where I am protected. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because you're kind of just always expecting to be burned, you know, and it does take away from your focus and concentration with just what's actually going on around you. You know, um, the Sam Darnold, I see ghosts type of comment. Like, I know we make a lot of fun out of that, but anyone who's really played the quarterback position really seriously and for a really long time, if you've been on a team where the defense was just kicking the crap out of you, occasionally, yeah, like you do kind of like, oh, oh, actually I was protected, you know, I'm good, you know, but I saw color, I saw a flash, you know, I, I didn't expect my running back to actually pick it up because the last seven times he hasn't, you know, so those things are, Uh, are real. And I think that's the first thing I noticed for Daniel Jones is just the inability to play within rhythm because their offensive line has been out of rhythm so often. Yeah, I think that's something that's somewhat evident throughout his at least 2023 film. So Matt, just uh, to revert back to 2022 a little bit, what do you attribute the jump in play independent of the coaching? What did Daniel Jones do differently to really ascend his game or do you attribute most of that to Brian Dable, Mike Kafka, and the system that was implemented? No, and this is what's great. You know, what what's more important, the chicken or the egg? You know, I mean, I don't know. They all just work 
cohesively together. And, and that's the key about the quarterback position that I think a lot of people just don't understand or give enough credit to is that Daniel Jones was finally given an opportunity to be with a coach that was younger, that was a little bit more obviously hungry to prove himself as his own individual, you know, voice as a head coach and play caller. Mike Kafka, his experience too, as far as him being a player, being able to express what he sees through the player's eyes to the quarterback, you know, and just being innovative. I mean, you know, here's a, a great example outside of, of pro football, but just like Josh Heupel in the Tennessee offense, you know, past two years, it's amazing. Look at it this year. Eh, right. It's not quite the same. So what do you got to do? You got to keep innovating and keep being creative and the ability I think that Dable has shown in his career to be an innovator has really played uh, tremendous dividends to him and his success with whoever his quarterback has been. Yeah, that, that there's no doubt about that. And I wanted to ask you, Matt, a, qu a question about Daniel Jones. Just this is a, a everything you've seen with Jones, dating back to his rookie season this year, last year, anything. If I had to ask you, or if someone had to ask you, what are the areas of Jones's game that you believe give him an edge over, let's say, the median NFL quarterback? And what are some of the areas that still need to get there? What, what, what would those two things be for you? His uh, his athleticism has to be one of them for sure, right? His athleticism is definitely above average as far as NFL standards, even though each and every year it seems like the athleticism about the position continues to increase and grow and become more prevalent and, and prominent as far as success. Um, the other aspect is like something that my father would say, like size is a skill. Dude is big. Dude is strong. And the ability to be big and strong in the pocket, I think, is something that is sometimes overlooked at the NFL game. Because you're just going against dudes that are monsters. You know, uh, people all the time, they're like, hey, you know, you're a pretty big guy, Matt. I'm like, yeah, but I was playing with guys that were six, seven, right. 300 pounds. So that's why I don't look very big. I <laughs> tell people, I'm like, Steph Curry's six, three, you know, but he's playing with seven footers out there. So, you know, I think his athleticism, his size and his ability to throw the football, I think, well in the pocket and out of the pocket are really kind of like his three main things that he does extremely well. And are there any areas on the flip side that you think need still need to get there? Um, for me personally, I just wish that he had like a little bit more just like shit to him, honestly. Like, I hate to say it that way, but like, I kind of wish that he just like a little bit more had like an NFU attitude a little bit at times. The, you know, the, the, the calm, cool thing, like it worked for Eli, but Eli also was a Manning, you know? Right. So it's like, he kind of got the benefit of the doubt, you know, just a little bit. Whereas with Daniel Jones, like I feel like occasionally doesn't quite get that benefit of the doubt because he's just another jo Jones, you know. So he's got to be, I think, at times like I would just like to see a little bit more of like what Saquon shows us that like that grit, that heart, the heart on your sleeve kind of a thing. And, and just like let it go. I, I say to so many of my young QBs, like when I played my worst is when I was trying to, you know, just please and do the job of others. And when I right. played my best, I was just like whatever man let's go like i was just kind of crazy and you know on edge and and i think that's something that i i you know sometimes wish he had a little bit more of it's just kind of like that edginess to him on both of those points i think nick and i both both agree that size really is an underrated trait because when you have that size in the pocket it helps you for so it helps you for when it comes to poise in the pocket will you stand in there will you throw will you take it can you take these hits over and over and also can yeah. you see over the line and, and throw into the middle of the field like i don't know how real or not this is but when you watch kyler murray when you watch russell wilson it's like they're not really utilizing the middle of the field how much look, of that is because yeah, go yeah. look at look at bryce young too you know right. i mean it's like oh the size doesn't matter his iq and all that listen dude you know yes you have to have a great iq but also you have to have the ability to just be physically dominant in a sport that's dominated by giants you know and sometimes no pun intended there with that comment but still Loved like it. you know like, <laughs> but you just you every now and then it's just like yeah the play call yeah not that great uh, whatever not going well still expect you to make the play and that's something that, like, I think, like, a guy like Kirk Cousins doesn't get enough credit for. Yeah. Like, yes. that dude has got courage. He's got onions for days. But he also could just throw it powerfully all over the football field. Yep. And, and that's where I think sometimes, like, we're very hard on him because of his prime time record and all that kind right. of stuff. 
Yeah. Too much of the QB wins, the uh, you know, debate is focused on Cousins. Like when you actually watch the tape, he's one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL for those no reasons. He throws with power all over the field, and he he among all quarterbacks I watch is one of the most uh, or is one of the best I should say it. Like standing the poise in the pocket and just that ability to know Dude. you're about to get hit and just throw the football anyway. Bro, he has absolutely taken like three years it's off crazy. of his life by yeah. hanging in there in the pocket <laughs> the way that he has. You know, and it's I just, know it's you know nuts. He, he's a nerd and he's a really cool nerd, and I love it. And he is just, you know, he just really, yeah, he just is, is so underappreciated in the modern game. And, you know, if you think about like the Redskins and the Vikings, it's like these teams wouldn't be half as good if they had another quarterback playing for yeah. them because of the skill sets that he people has. don't realize. Exactly. People always think about what's, you know, the green, the grass is always greener when it comes to those types of quarterbacks. No doubt. But no doubt. No doubt. And I thought the second thing he said was also really interesting about Jones, how it's like, you know, maybe part of that people always have this debate, Chris, with us, which is like, how much of why Jones is at least seemingly on tape less uh, aggressive in throwing to those windows and taking those chances is because, because he was with Pat Shermer during a rookie. And then how much of it is what happened with Garrett and judge and how much did they really change his mindset as a quarterback? Right. We don't really know that the answer to that. I don't, I'm not saying you do, but do you have any insight on that before we go to the next thing? Cause I'm just curious because people ask us about that a lot. You, you know, it's uh it's really interesting when you think about the position, how just uh, you know, it typically, I feel like when I was in Atlanta, for an example, Matt Ryan had an awful year. He really did. And he even shared that to me, too. He was just like, I really did not play as well as I wanted to play. Um, and I feel like I was at like kind of my worst at certain times. And you know what? The next year he won the MVP. And, and that's what's really cool, you know, is that one that he confided that in with me to say that, like, yeah, Matt, you know, I just wasn't playing as well as I would have liked to have played. And it really bothered me, you know. But what was cool, too, is that, like, he was a guy that was extremely disciplined. He worked hard. He was a great teammate. He was a great leader. And, you know, it, those great failures just, they they ignited him to just, you know, rethink about everything from how he went about his training to how to improve in those things that he didn't do well a year ago. You know, to, to building more of a rapport with Kyle Shannon and our offense. And all of a sudden, like, that next year, and you're just like, dude, it's a whole different player. You know, yeah. and a lot of it's just because he built the confidence within himself and those around him to then, you know, make that that, you know, uh, that jump, so to speak, into the quarterback that he knew that he was capable of being. I actually want to pivot off that for a quick second, because I, I I might have missed this in my research before the pod. But you so you played with a season under Kyle Shanahan, correct? Or you played with I played, I played for uh, Kyle uh, in the Atlanta Falcons for two seasons. Okay. Yep. Two seasons. Okay, that's awesome. So I want to ask you a little bit real quick about Kyle and uh, maybe less so because people always ask this, like what makes him so special? But I, I'm also more curious about like, because we watch about, we watch the success Bobby Sloak is having right now with CJ Stroud as a rookie right. behind what I think is a really bad offensive line that's had crazy amount of injuries and guys just weren't playing for them. And they're still finding success. What makes that specific system in your mind so successful against the current way NFL defenses are playing? Kyle, very much like all the the people that we were discussing with Dave on all that, just the the ability to to innovate. One, he had great surrounding. He had a great cast around him. You know, he had he had a great band. You know, playing mm -hmm. background for him all that mm -hmm. all those years. You know, Mike McDaniel, who um, I, I shared with my father, even on the podcast that we did a few weeks ago, where I was just like, I always knew that that guy was very, very smart and he was different and he was a huge part of why we were successful and the way that we went about dissecting defenses. And I even said, I was like, I just never thought that he'd be a head coach because I just thought he was a little bit of a, a strange guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and he kind of is, you know, you know, and it, it, cause he's really authentic and being himself. And I think that's something that like a lot of these guys, you know, he had great surrounding cast who thought like him, who worked hard like him. And whenever you're in a room with just multiple guys, I feel like like that, that really think that way about the game and are creative, good things happen, you know? And even, uh, you know, Doug Peterson, Frank Wright, um, God, the quarterback coach, I can't think of his name right now. Um, uh, but yeah, from San Fran? Yeah. No, from, uh, from Philadelphia when they were all together when they won the Super Bowl. But yeah, Doug Peterson, Frank Wright, you had Jim Schwartz on the defense. You know, it's like, so what do you think that room was like right. when they were talking football? Like that was a lot of really smart people breaking down each and every game and trying to figure out what our team does well and doesn't do well. 
And that's where you'd see those same things like and same sentiment with a lot of the teams and especially in Atlanta, you know, Dan Quinn, Raheem Morris, um, you know, Mike McDaniel, Matt LaFleur, uh, Mike LaFleur. Um, you know, there's a few others here that I'm forgetting and I, I'm sorry to go. Oh, Jeff Ulbrich, the defense mm-hmm. coordinator for the Jets. Yeah, um, so a hell it's just of a like job with the Jets this year, a lot of, you know, football junkies that know what they're talking about and know how to maximize what their players are doing on the field. Cause we were definitely not the most talented football team in the NFL. That's a fact, but we did have Matt Ryan. We did have Julio Jones and we did have a lot of really good, just team football players too. Real quick on that, Matt. So how important is just continuity among the coaching staff and how many like NFL teams or situations there, there's just not a lot of continuity. There's some animus among coaches and it's just set up for a dysfunctional environment. Cause what you just talked about with Kyle Shanahan and the talent that was on that team, it seems like they just have a ton of continuity and they were able to maximize every situation. Animus. Is that, is that a young con- uh, word right there? I love it. But, uh, <laughs> Carl um, Jung is that has you're... like the most expansive vocabulary of anyone I've ever talked to definitely in or Carl... outside of work. And it's just like half the words he says, I don't even know. No, and that was, <laughs> that was definitely a Carl Jung type of, uh, Dude, I love right the there. fact that you're talking um, about Carl Jung on this podcast. For sure. Right now. We, we could do that too. Cause he would have been perfect for, for football teams. Um, All Nick needs to do is start rhyming his words. And it'll be like a young Walt Clyde Frazier. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> but to, to answer your question, um, um, that's why I think Dan Quinn is one of those guys that's so highly regarded in the uh, NFL world is because he was really good at just creating that relationship with players and with coaches all the time and, and building an environment that allowed individuals to be themselves while still understanding like the greater good around them. And Sometimes, you know, there, there are guys like I've been a part of teams where like there was coaches that didn't see eye to eye or get along with each other, but they at least, you know, worked well with each other as far as the big picture of the goal and whether or not they played or hung out with each other after, you know, they, you know, that didn't matter, but they knew when they were there on the field together in that room together working that they were able to solve these problems to work together cohesively to make each other better, you know, whether they knew it or not, but um, it, it's so important. It, culture is an absolute real thing. And, uh, and Dan Quinn w- was phenomenal at building that culture. And a lot of his lessons that he learned were from Pete Carroll. And, um, it, it's, it's very true. You know, those things too, like you just, you see, it, it's very apparent with a lot of his football teams with Pete, uh, specifically, and then with Dan and what he did in Atlanta was very special. And I think also why a lot of people always have him very high on the, you know, next head coach's list uh, because he has that ability to do that. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, Chris. I mean, sorry, Matt, I was thinking. That's all right. It's the second time you've done that, but it's okay. I'm not counting. No. <laughs> My bad, Matt. It's, no, it's been a good. long day for me here. Over, over no, I, I tell people all the time. I'm just like, my real name is Matthew Christopher Phil <laughs> Sims. You know? yeah. I answered to all of them, you know. I'm glad I didn't say Phil yet. Yeah. At least. But, um, so I was going to ask you one more on Daniel, and then we'll, we'll move forward to some play, play, uh, play breakdown. Sorry. If you could build in your mind an ideal team around, let's just say Daniel Jones's skill set as a quarterback, would it be one of those wide receiver heavy teams uh, with questionable pass protection? I think of the 2011 Eli Manning Giants as the best example of that. Or would it be closer to maybe the 2008 Giants, which were very run heavy, play action shots under center? Where would you? What would you for his skill set? What's the ideal offense? Yeah, I, I honest, I'm going to be annoying and I'll say it's probably like a mix of the two. You know, you don't okay. necessarily have to be like a super dominant offensive line to still be successful or, or excel at one field or the other, whether it's pass protection or in the run game. You know, a lot of it just has to be with just consistently consistency with that group. And I think that's really what is missing right now with this Giants offense is just the fact that it really has been a revolving door at different positions, particularly the tackles, Mm -hmm. which really are, you know, the anchors of your offensive line in modern NFL football. Whereas, you know, the guard and center, you know, we can double here or there with certain looks and kind of help each other out. If you are weak at your tackle positions in the NFL, especially in today's NFL and each and every year, it just gets worse and worse. Um, you're in trouble. So I, I would say that 
you know, he's a guy that has the ability to do stuff in wide open sets because he's a great athlete. So you could do a right. lot of those, you know, RPO type of concepts, those QB run concepts where you have a man advantage. Um, but he's also a big enough, strong enough guy too to do the stuff that's under center, do the he heavy, hard play actions, throw the ball aggressively down the field. So I think that, you know, like most quarterbacks, they're capable of a little of everything. The key is, is just, you know, can you, can you doctor it up? Can you protect it enough? Can you be uh, balanced enough as far as a play caller and being creative to making sure that you're just not giving the defense an advantage to kind of tee off on, on some of your players? Real quick before we get into the plays, Matt, yeah. as a former Tennessee volunteer and yeah. <laughs> the son of a New York Giant great, how excited were you when the Giants selected Jalen Hyatt? Uh, I was actually very excited. I really, I thought it was so cool. I really was. And, uh, um, it's just, uh, that's, what's so cool about football. It really is. It's just the ability to, uh, see different parts of the world and the country, um, to meet people from different parts of the country, you know, from suburbia to the cities, to the, to the cornfields, all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, it just, the sport has the ability to kind of take you places where you never thought were possible. And, um, you know, Jalen Hyatt, very excited for him. And, uh, you know, he dealt with crazy fans in Tennessee and he's going to deal with crazy fans here in New York. And so I think he's at least uh, accustomed to that stuff and and having, uh, you know, a, a lot of pressure on you to be successful. Yeah, it's already happening for him. I don't know if you saw the social <laughs> media post he put up this week, but yeah. Giants fans took it in the worst possible way. And they just took a crazy spin on it, as as Giants fans typically tend to do. At least yeah, no doubt. Do. <laughs> Stay off the social media for, for yeah. all players, Jets and Giants alike. Seriously. <laughs> and here we are. We're going to pull up some of these Woo! plays as well. It's going to be fun to break this down with you, Matt, man. I'm, I'm excited for this. Dan is excited for this as well. Let me just hit this real quick. Get rid of the green screen. I got to okay. hit full screen now myself. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, let's dive into this first play. Speaking of one Jalen Hyatt, I just want to ask you, what exactly is going through Daniel Jones's mind on this play? I'll run the play real quick. This was week two against the Arizona Cardinals. First play out of the halftime break. And this was on first down? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so this is an interesting look. So here, go ahead and just pause it right here. And, and this is what I find just really interesting about this picture from the start here and probably what Daniel Jones was noticing too. For most quarterbacks and most QB rooms and all that kind of stuff, you're kind of just like, what's the odd area of the field right now? And for me, that would be between, you know, this corner here on the bottom of the screen and that safety up there on the top on the hash. You know, there's just that huge void between those two defenders right there. And usually when there's a huge void, it's because it's being filled by somebody else or someone is totally effing up at that same time. But in this case, I would say that the safety that's rolled down here, weak side over here, close to us in the boundary, is most likely going to be dropping back. So I view this as a look where they're trying to show you that it's potentially maybe one high or a quarter, quarter, half with an invert look, right, in this boundary. Or it's going to be straight quarters, and then this safety is going to slowly backpedal out of this position and get to his near side quarters part of the football field. And I think this is what the Giants knew this as well. This is why I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of those plays where after the half, they're like, we've seen this look a few different times, and mm -hmm. now we're going to go to this play because we've seen it and we feel very confident about it. We have a bunch set up top. It looks like at the top, that's why I thought it was quarters all the way because that outside backer or nickel there is outside the point man. So that shows me that he's most likely the flat defender. Right. And in this case, the middle linebacker is your whole defender, which is typically between the hashes where he is. And then this weak side backer is your will. And since the back is to him, uh, he is probably only going to get as wide as number two is, which is the back. So I see this as a we're trying to hide quarter, quarter, half invert, or it's just quarter, quarter, uh, quarters. And we'll roll the play real quick. Got and I think false start. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people are getting away with false starts this year. That's a hot topic. It's a hot topic on Twitter. Now, Matt, so I, I think you're spot on with the with the analysis of of a, this was a, a play that the Giants constructed in halftime. They're like, we're, we're going to hit this because yeah. you watch how the safety turns and he reacts to Darren Waller on the backside, which opens up because you have outside leverage on that outside bottom cornerback right there. Right. It just opens up this skinny post. And it's interesting enough 
because the Jets, they're a, they're a heavy quarter system, and the Giants are about to play the Jets uh, right. this week. They had a bunch of shot plays from these condensed inside the numbers looks to A.J. Brown dialed up. The Eagles did, and uh, the safety bit down on backside crosses. So I'm wondering if the Giants could hit a similar play like this. So pause them. it right here, or actually just go back just a little bit and pause it. Yeah, right about here. So it's a bunch set. It's three by one formation. The weak side safety here, number 22, typically in a three by one set is pushing. So it'd be quarters push to that three receiver side. So that's why I think he has such ha heavy eyes on Waller here as he's running across. The gentleman who I think makes the big mistake here is this field safety here where he typically should see Waller cross face and then he should either uh, once he sees him kind of cross, he should know that his weak side safety is going to help and kind of condense that for him. So he really should be the one that's kind of staying vertical and playing for the potential post, either backside or to his play side. So he shouldn't be so flat and have so much uh, eyes in the backfield in this situation. And that's where I think 20, the corner here in the bottom, kind of gets left on an island because I think he is expecting some sort of inside help from either the safety up here on the top of the screen or potentially the corner who would replace two in certain corners looks. Um, so that, that's where I think they really took advantage of the Cardinals kind of getting stuck with their own rules and who's responsible for who. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that safety at the top of the screen, if you watch the first half, he drove down aggressively on Darren Waller several times. I think he hit Darren Waller in a kidney with one of the shots, and Darren Waller ended up dropping the football. So that makes I a lot really, of sense. I remember that. I remember that. And that's probably what they saw. They probably saw that this safety's cutting too much and mm -hmm. unnecessarily. And uh, and you can kind of just see already, too, like even from the end zone cut that, that you guys shared with me, he just has his eyes way too heavy in the backfield. Um, and, and that typically happens, too, with quarters, defenders or safeties, because they do have some run responsibilities more so than than typical two deep coverages. Oh, uh, yeah. You could see that little side shuffle that he gives his eyes. You're right. Oh, it's side. And then he's at this moment. He's like, I fucked up. May, uh, possibly. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> But beautiful throw, awesome yes. throw, really good. You see Jalen Hyatt's ability to stretch the field vertically, and you see just how naturally he tracks the football down the field, and that just goes to all of his reps at Tennessee in that offense, yeah. what he was asked to do. Really good. That's play. one of the most underrated traits about Jalen Hyatt that I feel like, and just general evaluating receivers. Nick and I have talked about this on our draft podcast, preview right. podcast, like last three years, tracking the ball in the air. It's something people don't talk about enough, and it's like, for the from for these receivers on the vertical plane, it's almost everything in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's everything. That hand eye is unbelievable to to uh, the ability. This is what's really cool too about it, and like what's important for evaluators when you see the ball thrown here. Watch how he tucks his chin to his shoulder, but he continues to pump his arms and then slowly adjust his upper body to catch the football. So he does a really good job of kind of running full speed and looking over his shoulder. And then when he notices the ball that's slightly underthrown, that's when he starts to open up his chest and kind of get a little bit more square to the football. So you could just see that that's just something that's very natural and innate to him from his uh, experience. Awesome. Because it's great to be a Tennessee Vol. That's right. Vol <laughs> for life, baby. <laughs> All right. Let's go to this next play. This is just, I just want, you to tell our audience how difficult this throw is from Terod Taylor uh, <laughs> to Jalen Hyatt. Throw. Crazy yeah, this is from the end zone angle too is even crazier. Well, the Tyrod, I saw Tyrod do that. I was with the Bills uh, for OTAs and training camp when when I was there with Greg Roman, Rex Ryan, and Tyrod, and I saw Tyrod make a lot of unbelievable plays in practice, and he was really fun to watch. So yeah, let's just go to the the end zone real quick, and we'll kind of take you through Tyrod's brain here for a yeah. second. So we have, you could just, yeah, pause it right here is perfect. We have a two high defense and they're, they're trying to kind of make it look like they might be going to one high or whatever. They're playing games a little bit, but it's pretty too high. Like right from the start, Tyrod heavy inside zone play action to your left. He's turning his back to the defense right now. They're in a 13 personnel. So they have three tight ends on the field and one receiver, right? Darren Waller is the one that's outside to the left here. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to make number 25 right there, who is in the B gap, jump into the gap a little bit more aggressively so they can throw right off his ear right behind him on like a little drift concept, um, which is basically like a sloppy in or post route by Darren Waller. And what Tyrod's really got to focus on doing is getting his head around aggressively as possible and then planting on this last right foot here 
and then ripping the football. He does a quick little bounce reset because he can do that. He's athletic enough to do that. He probably could have ripped it in there. Actually, I know that he can because he's absolutely yeah. capable of doing that. But he didn't trust it. And in this situation, too, a tight football game, I totally get why he didn't. Right. And this is why Tyrod's a great backup, you know, and a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback, too, because he's not going to take unnecessary risks. So he doesn't see it very cleanly. He pulls it back. Now he's extending the play to really just maybe scramble for a first down. But then as he's running, I love this right here, too. You see how he gets his shoulders parallel to the to the yes. line of scrimmage. When you get your shoulders to the parallel to the line of scrimmage, this allows you the ability to throw the football aggressively down the field. So even though he's running laterally to the sideline here, his shoulders parallel to the line of scrimmage allow him to create tremendous torque and velocity. So right here, you see that left shoulder has turned into that right foot, right? And he is going to take one more step. Now watch as he turns. See how he turned his upper body over that right foot? Mm. Now he is just spun like, and he's tight like a coil, and he can unleash and just rip around his rib cage aggressively through that throw. And with his arm flexibility, he makes this throw look even more impressive. But you see how that push and drive off that right foot, yep. perfect jump man right there. But that <laughs> drive off that right foot, it's just like a harpoon right off his hand, pushing through it. It almost so, looks like the Jordan insignia. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> it's it's great. It's a great rep. It's great, great form. And look to, you know, if you can kind of slow it down as he releases it. This is something that I tell QBs. All, look how far out in front his arm is when he releases the football. You know, so many people talk about now as far as the QB world of like trying to flick your wrist or be quick. He lets go of that football and it's almost like a full, you know, foot or two away from his body mm -hmm. as he's driving through it. So just like a great power puncher in boxing, he's getting all of his power behind the ball as long as possible as he's throwing this. It's a beautiful rep. Damn, that was an unbelievable breakdown, Matt. <laughs> I've never heard that the anything at this position described like that. Like just thinking about that, like the power punch, like you get the full extension on that yeah. release. It has to give you more. Uh, that was an incredible breakdown. Now I almost wish we just did the whole podcast you breaking down tape, but, <laughs> but this has been great. Anything else on this play that stood out to you? We, 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 we don't have a great view on it, but we did look at it, Nick and I, after the pod and, or, you know, after the game and how it did get those feet in. So if this, this was actually called back by Evan Neal being called for one of those, those calls there, they call now yeah. lineman downfield, even though he reestablished fine lines or whatever, oh, but it's a terrible, he did call. Get those feet. <laughs> terrible call. Yeah. And he admitted it on the broadcast too, by the way, like two seconds later, like, yep, we missed that one, but um, <laughs> they never do. They never go against the refs on the look, look how like oh the call pisses me off to the top of the screen okay. you'll see evan neal right he gets downfield as he's blocking and then he realizes where he is he has the awareness to understand where he is takes two steps back tyrod still has the football and then tyrod throws a football on this oh. fucking oh I'm sorry my cursing but this ref still threw the flag <laughs> man he had take lock on this he did. Oh, unbelievable throw off. really is and just it's crazy it. It really, it's just so, it's so impressive. And this is, this is what the modern quarterback has to do extremely well, right? You have to be able to throw the football aggressively down the field, moving outside the pocket. You know, he has no time to set up here. If he yeah. does, he's going to get hit. So his arm flexibility, his body flexibility and his athleticism really is the difference between, you know, being an average guy and being what Tyrod is, which is a really, really good quarterback. Awesome. And, that, and we're going to take a gonna, look at Yeah, go ahead. Nate. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, now we have a switch release against the Minnesota Vikings. And this is a field side throw. We don't we don't see Daniel Jones challenge the field side too often. But I just um want to ask you what's going through his mind on this play as we watch the switch release and how the defense might have muddled the coverage. Yeah, so this is interesting. And, and that's the field side throw stuff. That's just a lot of o offensive coordinators in general. And that's something to me that's like a very underutilized thing because I feel like a lot of guys are very capable of doing it. But a lot of coordinators have been burned in their careers, you know, with those type of plays. So they feel like they play in fear of them. Um, this switch release right here. This is what's interesting to me about this defense. It, it has almost like a semblance of like to Tampa, but without two. And that's what I'm a little bit confused at when I watch this because everyone essentially is playing man to man coverage at the top of the screen. You have a very simple, just like drive in cut concept with a halfback angle uh, by the running back out of the backfield, which Minnesota plays extremely well, probably still could have thrown the shallow cross for an easy completion and catch and run for a first down. But then at the top here, you have a really just a simple basic switch release, just seam 
uh, which maybe, you know, I would think was, it was, yeah, it probably was just going to be a seam, but it just a switch release go. And they must've known that this play side safety wasn't going to play deep and wide enough. And they knew that they were going to try to match in this type of look. And they did a great job of, of basically getting into the wake as I've heard great coaches say, right? So you're going to see the top receiver dive down and then that bottom receiver kind of gets into the wake, right, of that top receiver and mm -hmm. then goes right off his heels and tries to hold that red line right down the sideline. So a great job of uh, essentially causing, you know, pass interference, so to speak, like on a pick play, but down the field very naturally. And mm -hmm. it's just a, a really good play design and taking advantage of, uh, of this spe specific coverage, which is like a four match, um, or, or maybe they were getting to some sort of man robber look, but you know, Harrison Smith stays vertical to his side for a very long time. He only kind of turns and runs when the ball is thrown. Right. So I was a little confused by actually what this coverage was, you well, know, but you, you joined thousands of Vikings fans who were confused by a lot of the coverage. <laughs> from Ed Donzel. Well, I don't know. Like it's very strange. Cause it's got man qualities everywhere, you know, here at the bottom there at the top, but the safeties kind of throw me off. So I almost wonder if it was like a four, four match and then the safeties were just going to double whoever they thought was the most primary person to double in their their area but a really good play design great throw down the field and, and again i love the patience too by whoever this receiver was that caught it Richie um James. richie yeah the, his his shoulders again are going to be parallel to us here in the end zone as he's tracking this football and again you're going to see that chin to shoulder right there and i love his He's slow. He's starting to throttle down his momentum because he feels that he's close to the sideline. So that ability to just control his body, but still have great eye discipline on the football is, is absolutely tremendous. Awesome. That's, yeah. Really well broken down, Matt. Thank you so much. Uh, I love this, uh, this play, those switch release, Daniel Jones. It's Very like cool. he knew exactly, exactly where he was going with this football. And the Giants ran so many switch releases specifically early in the season. And they didn't yeah. always throw it. They usually threw the drag route that just shallow right. cross by right. whether it was Daniel Bellinger or slot receiver. But here he identified and recognized that there was some sort. I don't know if it was a miscommunication because, again, I don't know the coverage either. But Kenny Galladay does a damn good job occupying two defenders and allowing uh, Richie James come open on that switch. Really good. And th this is where they must have known that this play side safety, the field side safety was no threat to covering this because Daniel doesn't even look it off either. He's, he's going right. to it right away. So that, that kind of tells me right there that they knew that they were going to have trouble switching this off and that they were taking this one-on-one -on -one shot. Uh, but you're, you're, it's really interesting. The shallow is definitely a completion. The in cuts definitely a completion. Um, so it actually really didn't matter here for Daniel. He was going to be uh, successful no matter what in this play. <laughs> I wonder if it's because Minnesota was being burned by that backside crossing route up until this game. And maybe Harrison right. Smith was somewhat baiting it because it looks like that that, cro that got the uh, cornerback at the top of the screen on the 50. He has to work over top of Daniel Bellinger's cornerback as well, that defensive back or whoever that is. Yeah. So he has leverage to the inside where Harrison Smith is somewhat waiting for him. So I'm wondering if that kind of played into it and the Giants saw it on film leading up to this play. Yeah, it's definitely possible. Yeah, what yeah but awesome those are the three play. plays. Yep. <laughs> that was awesome. Wish, wish we had more, man. You, you were yeah. excellent. Thanks. <laughs> I, yeah. you know, I, I just made it up. Uh, none of that's true. No. <laughs> yeah. That was a different level. And look, I, I learn a lot through film analysis basically every day, every week, some through Nick, some through people I study on, on, on Twitter and on different, you know, JT O'Sullivan's a great, I think he does a great job with the quarterback. Fantastic. School. But yeah. this, this, this is another level of it, Matt. Like this is some, and I know he played the game as well and he, he, he's on that same level, but like there are things that you brought up during this that I just never really thought about from the quarterback position. And so it's really cool to see um, and cool to hear. And thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with us, football, talk quarterback, break down plays with us. This is as good as it gets for us. No, this is fun, man. This is uh, you know, I, I love doing this. It's, this is what playing in the NFL would have been like, you know, it's just, Dudes just got off the practice. Let's go watch some more football. Let's discuss what worked, what didn't work. You know, how could we make it work better? You know, how can you improve? And uh, and that's what's so fun about it, too. So I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to share my love of the game with you guys here today. Well, we loved it, too. And Matt, before we get out of here one more time, let people know where they can find you on social media and everything that you're doing outside of that as well. Yeah, so uh, Sims Complete on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and then I got the Sims Complete podcast with with Big Phil, uh, Super Bowl MVP Phil Sims. You know, <laughs> he knows a thing or two about a thing or two. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we just, you know, talking ball. So uh, wherever podcasts are available, you know, subscribe, tune in, check us out and hopefully, uh, hopefully you enjoy it. All right. Well, that was Matt Sims to everybody else. Have a great rest of your weekend and we'll talk to you soon.